Okay, let's get started after our break for lunch. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Hello. Go ahead, Bill, you're on. Okay, I gotta get my cat off the table here. Sorry, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> um, Mr. Chairman and members of the, the council, thanks for taking the time to meet with us. We're Save Holland Lake up here in the Sealy Swan Valley. And basically what we want, thank you for allowing us to participate today. Uh, last night we presented the Sealy Swan or Sealy Lake Community Council, which is part of the County Commissioner's Listening Group, and wanted to reach out to you after I talked to Tim Ryan and I talked to Gwen Lankford and Thompson Smith and Anna Wedding Sorrell and Shane Rougeau, and they said to reach out to the council and make sure you know what we're doing up here and apprise you of what we're doing on this project that's been proposed at Holland Lake. And who we are, we're about 3,600 members online. Uh, this has just evolved over the last two months. It's just an ad hoc grassroots movement. We're not politically aligned. You know, we're a group of Democrats, Republicans, independents, non-ideological, but business people, real estate people, retired forest service people, engineers, um, all kinds of people that have opposed this project that's been proposed for Holland Lake, which is tripling the expansion of the Holland Lake Lodge and having a huge impact on, on that pristine lake there and the wildlife and ecosystem as well. And we just we just wanted to make sure you know where we're coming from on this. Um, this is, as you know, probably know when I sent you some advanced documents, this is public land, this is Forest Service land. That, that Holland Lake sits on. And it's just teeming with wildlife and endangered and threatened species. And this project will have a huge impact on not only the bull trout, grizzly bear, lynx, loons, and all kinds of wildlife in between those two wilderness areas between the swans and the Mission Range, and the Mission Mountain Wilderness and the, the Bob Marshall Wilderness to the east. Um, what, what riled people up in this valley was that the Forest Service has been working with Powder, one of North America's largest ski developers, and Holland Lake Lodge for two years on this project. And they didn't, for two years, and didn't announce this until September 1st, and then told the public they had three weeks to comment on it. Uh, we thought that was unreasonable, and there were howls of pro protests from not just in this valley, but across Montana and across the country. They extended the comment period, and there were 6,500 comments um, sent into the Far Flathead National Forest, which is very unprecedented as far as, as you know, and, and remarking on even forest ser service forest plans. So huge comment we counted all of those some of the, the folks who counted those are on this call with us and 6500 comments almost 99 percent were opposed to this project the comments and this came from all over the country not just in the valley and condon in the immediate area but all over the country and people from all over the world because they know how special holland lake and the sealy swan valley is to to, to us and to the folks that inhabited it before we were here, indigenous people as well. Um, so our big policy question to the Forest Service and to senators and legislators, as, state legislators as well, how much tourism and recreation are you going to allow on public land and, and, and monetize that public land to the detriment of our, you know, the rural community that's up here, the wildlife, the uh, emergency and disaster services, highway and set and county commissioners and the tribe. So we've pushed back on this process and said, 
the people need to be heard here. And we met, we just met with the, the Region One Forest Service office and the Deputy Regional Forester last week, and we had a productive meeting and they heard us. And David Roberts, who is an engineer, walked them through the inaccuracies and misinformation that had been put out there. So we just wanted to fill you in on wh where we're coming from and make sure that the Forest Service is reaching out to you and other tribes about this proposal because they do have a commitment to, to you know, as government to government to reach out to you as well. So we know how important this area is to the, the, the Salish you know, Kootenai tribe and other tribes in the region. Um, and I just wanted to turn this over to to David, who's an engineer, just to run you quickly through some of the inaccuracies that we found and pointed out to the Forest Service and to Powder into the Holland Lake Lodge that have not been corrected so far and that they didn't bring up that we brought up. So, and we want, just so you know where we're coming from. So I'll turn it over to David and he has a quick PowerPoint. It's extensive, but we'll go through quickly understanding your time commitments here. Thank you. All right, I'm going to try to share my screen here. So let me make sure. Everybody see that OK? Yeah. Yeah. So OK, I'm just going to do this really quick. This was the whole presentation we did for the Forest Service. But um, the first point we brought up, which we don't really need to hit here today, is just the actual business entity and whether the current special use permit is even still valid since the business entity is um changed hands technically the special use permit should be invalidated and the screening process should have started over um but that's not really something to go into depth with here i think um from today i just wanted to give a little bit of information but also just open up for questions because i'm not sure what has been presented to date um within your organization but the you know the biggest thing we hit right off the bat is the master development plan as submitted is factually inaccurate in a lot of places and basically entirely incomplete in other places where no one could really make an accurate assessment of how the project is going to impact the land or how it's how it can even proceed um the single biggest thing is that from the beginning they stated the acreage of the permit area inaccurately and indicated that the entire project would be occurring within the existing special use permit area. Um, you know that goes from everything from the Forest Service scoping letter that says this is occurring within the existing 15 acre permit area. Um, says that in multiple Forest Service documents that then repeats it within the master development plan submitted by powder the existing special use permit is a 10.53 acre parcel um again i'm going to kind of jump down but just historically on this parcel this current boundary 10.53 acres has been in place since 1963 i think my note here is inaccurate saying 61 but early 60s so the the basic parcel's been in place for with the forest service for 60 years prior to that it was actually smaller the 1935 was the first map we could find it was 7.93 acres although the course corresponding permit was five acres 4.95 the 51 map was 4.95 um this was just the presentation we did to basically create a visual of what they're proposing compared to what's there now. The current special use limit is the orange area, 10.53 acres. The red is actually what they're asking for in the proposal, which expands this lakefront area by 3.63 acres and also asks for another 5.22 acres for the wastewater plant that's an expansion required only to support the lodge expansion that has nothing to do with campground or recreational use it's only based on the water use of the of the lodge um nowhere have they ever defined the operating season in any way that allows anybody to actually assess how this is going to impact the environment of the area that everything they say i mean in the in the special or in the uh, master development plan that has submitted 
they just say approximate and basically it's approximately 215, 220 days. Um, they only, only put in two sentences on the operating season in total. Um, previous operating permit, when it was previously utilized year round was 320 days a year. Whole lot of the information powder has put out there publicly repetitively is that they truly intend to use this as a year round destination, which would be a substantially higher impact than anything they've submitted to date. Um, again, just to give a feel of the lay of the land currently compared to what's proposed, this is just a Google Earth shot of what's there currently, the five cabins, the lodge, the welcome center, and the manager's house. And this is what they're proposing there now, which is, you know, you basically go from 25 developed parking places to 135. That's all the orange area. You go up to 36 cabins, a new 13,000 square foot lodge, which I actually think is an underestimate of the actual footprint square foot footage based on the maps that we've received. Huge expansion to the restaurant surrounding the existing lodge. Um, and then just as we ran down through it, again, the, uh, the master development plan as, as it's submitted is basically totally incomplete and inaccurate as far as even wildlife corridors, any assessment. I mean, it specifically states that over the last 17 years, there's never been a grizzly bear sighting at Holland Lake Lodge, even though some of the local FWP managers have documented that they've responded to grizzly interaction at the lodge. Um, adjacent parcel holder sent us a trail cam picture where grizzly is on private land this fall in October, transiting the land, you know, less than a mile from the lodge. Um, everything else that, I mean, we get into, you know, FWP and Forest Service recommendations about setbacks from the lake to not damage the lakefront to not endanger the riparian zones, um, basically has all been ignored in the current planning documents. So the impact of the actual lakefront is enormous. Um, again, this goes back to the actual impact of the wastewater plant and what, what the actual infrastructure impacts are gonna be from the business. Um, and then just the public comments to date you know, this was, this was the group of comments that was registered on the public site as of the close of the comment period, which we read through everyone, tried to classify everyone. Only 74 were basically, yes, this is a good idea. We're in full support of this as proposed. So just over 1%. Um, and I would comment that, you know, two of those were the owner's mother. A bunch of those were out of state. Um, people that have stayed at the lodge once or twice. So it's, it's pretty, um, I guess, pretty direct uh, mirror of how the public has actually responded to this proposal. Um, but from there, I guess I'd just like to take questions and see what other information I could provide or we could provide that would be helpful just because I, I don't know how this has been presented to date or what interaction has occurred. Uh, and Mr. Chairman, if I could just introduce Jim Morris and who's on the call too, he's a Missoula and he was former, he's a retired forest service employee and he has some really good insights on the process itself and just the wildlife impacts too. So Jim, if you just, if you could summarize what you've been thinking about here too, we'd, we'd appreciate it. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your time. Um, one thing I'll add to what David just said is that if you just look at the expansion of the season of use to include through January, this would increase the visitor use days in the upper Swan Valley by 30 to 40,000 visitor days per year. And they're not gonna all hang out on that 10 acre plot on that little island on Swan Lake they're, or on Holland Lake. They're gonna spread throughout the valley and beyond. Um, so the impacts are gonna be far and wide, uh, particularly to wildlife habitat connectivity between the Swan Range and the Mission Mountains uh, for wide range of wildlife species like grizzly bears and wolverines and lynx and others. Um, this is also an area of really high quality winter range. And so as they ex extend the use into the winter time, this could have serious negative impacts on elk, deer, moose, and other ungulates that utilize that winter range throughout the, the, late, the late winter and the spring. Um, and as you all know, the, 
This is a disjunct population of threatened bull trout. It's a home of nesting common loons, all of which will be negatively, negatively affected uh, by this proposal. Um, and it's our view that the Forest Service has a duty to protect the public interest, uh, not the financial interest of a few individuals that seek to profit off of an excessive development on precious public land. Um, so we're gonna to continue to work to oppose this project and, and we hope that the tribes will, will join us in that effort. Again, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer whatever I can. Thank you, Jim. And just if I could know, uh, Mr. Chairman, Martin and I, the director of the Bowley Center for People and Forests has also sent out, I'll send a, forward this letter to you and, and the Bowley Center is created to increase public our participation in the Forest Service. And it was started by Arnold Bully under the direction of Senator Lee Metcalf decades ago. And what Martin told the Forest Service is that using a categorical exclusion just will not fly in this case. This is not a small project. This is a huge project. But two, that the, the public that he, he's never seen, and he, rarely has he seen the kind of outpour, public outpouring against a proposal proposal like this and basically turning the public not into participants but into antagonists and that's what we've told the forest service is that they've lost the public trust here they can gain it back by involving the public but they haven't done that to date and that's been why people are so angry in this valley and i'll forward this letter to you it's very a very cogent letter from martin about this whole process so thank you mr chairman <clears throat> Bill, Mr. Chairman, if I could add one other point to share, um, there was also a letter from 37 prominent Montana wildlife biologists who strongly oppose this project uh, due to its impacts on wide ranging wildlife uh, between the Swan Range and the Mission Range. Um, so I think that that's a very informative, strong statement from so many prominent biologists. All right. Well, thank you, Bill and David and uh, Jim for your um, information. Um, we did have a presentation through our historic preservation office where the uh, preservation specialist from the forest came in and presented the mm -hmm. scope of the project to us to, for, for, for that particular um, requirement of government to government consultation, uh -huh. cultural resource impacts. So we are in the process of having a review for that uh, particular issue uh, right now as, as we speak. So uh, does council have any questions for, go ahead, Terry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm Councilman Pitts from the Dixon District. I, uh, no, I'm not speaking for the council, I'm speaking for myself. I'm not in favor of this. What I've often wondered is if things were to stop right at this moment, that if you could take us out, I'll bet you just because of the publicity that you've received, you're gonna have a huge increase this year whether nothing else is done. Excuse me, Mr. Chairman, Councilman. You mean a huge increase in visitation, or what, what do you what do you mean there? Visitation. People that didn't know about it. Now that people are going to come up there, and uh, it's a beautiful place, and they're going to share <laughs> that, and probably more people will come. So there right. will be an impact for, uh, for right. a period of time. Right, Mr. Chairman and Councilman and. And I live up here in Sealy Lake and just standing out on Highway 83 over the last two years, especially because of COVID and people being able to work and live wherever they want to. Now we've just seen a double or tripling of traffic just along Highway 83 between Yellowstone and Glacier. And as you know, that Yellowstone series with Kevin Costner has increased visitation to Montana, driven up housing prices. Businesses up here can't... Uh, find workers and the people up here can't afford homes. I mean, that's putting the pressure on homes. So all of those things like tourism or recreation have economic impacts as well on the region. So we're very aware of that too. And I wanna be sure that you, you know about it as well, but not only the, the ecosystem effects, but also the economic effects in the region up here. So thanks for that point. I know personally myself, I would not, uh, I would not be the forest manager that would sign off on this project. <laughs> <laughs> it is, it goes way beyond a CADEX in my opinion. Right. Uh, definitely. Uh, those are kind of the questions I had for the uh, forest service representatives that were here. 
Uh, what does this mean for, you know, cumulative effects outside of it for worker housing, et cetera. That's one thing I love about um, the valley next door, our, our country over there is that it, 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 it has a low, low population base, has a lot right. of assets. And so I would like to freeze it in time if I could. <laughs> Definitely. Um, that, it seems that's the best use. That's the wisest use we could do. We don't create more Swan Valley. So, right. mm -hmm. so, you know, it's so precious. You want to hang on to it. Um, you want to make sure that the experience that I had hiking down the trail there and soaking my feet in the in the Holland Lake, uh, that my grandchildren can have that without any impediment. So um, I don't know if anybody else has any. Go ahead, Carol. Yeah, Mr. Chair. Hey, Bill, this is Carol. Like Hi, Carol. My computer's not working. Irritating. <laughs> I, I, saw anyway, you, I, I saw you. I saw you. I saw you earlier. Yes, I yeah, saw you. I just wanted to say that you know we're all experiencing um, this influx of people, and a lot of them are rude. Mm -hmm. I don't know where they're from, but I don't know. They don't have Montana values, that's for sure. And and so I think what I hear the council saying, and we haven't taken action or anything, but that we could definitely. Uh, support something like this and so I think in order to put a letter together I don't know if the chairman already has something started or or if we need information from them to go ahead and draft a letter of support to move I think forward. All I was doing Carol was waiting on our historic preservation office to come back with okay. recommendations because um, we have cultural resources there we want to make sure we're covered in our comments right. and um, that's where we have our big our big stick um, and we'll want to use that that uh, big stick as best we can. Sure. And Bill, you've worked with us long enough that you know that we cover our bases and stuff. And so no, I appreciate what the chairman has to say. And good to hear from all of you. And happy holidays. Yeah, you too. And Councilwoman, Le Mr. Chairman, Councilwoman Lake, for you. I appreciate you. I mean, the people we at our meeting last night with the CLA Community Council. That what they talked about. Some of the members of the council said that. They were seeing the same kind of thing and trash left out for grizzly bears to get into. And as you know, a fed bear is a dead bear. And, and, and they talked about fires and fire season and making new residents aware. So they were going to talk to the Realtors Association and businesses to put together kind of packets of when you move in here, these are the local values of these are the these are the local values of this area. And this is what you need to look for. And this summer, I had the, the chance, the opportunity to drive over the divide over the, the Jocko Road with Governor Schweitzer, my wife and his wife, over to the Arlie Powwow to, with, to meet with Anna and, uh, you know, and her family. And we had, but I'd never been over. That is an amazing natural area that's just spectacular and beautiful. And I'd never seen that before in the dams that were up there and the, the water resources that are so precious. It's, it's a, this whole valley connecting the you know, Bob Marshall Wilderness to this from the Swan Range to the Valley to the missions over to the you know to our Lee and the the, the, uh, the the mission mountains it's just spectacular and we need to, to work to protect it mr chairman if I could offer just a couple more points on the you mentioned the consultation government to government and on the historic preservation you may already be aware but I want to point out so please forgive me if I'm being redundant here that the forest plan for the Flathead National Forest requires that the forest take what they call an all lands approach and coordinate with the tribes um, in ways that lead to a stable and increasing fish and wildlife populations um, and increase the connectivity of habitat um, across the landscape in this part of the country across the Flathead National Forest. Um, so in addition to the historic preservation, I hope you will hold the Flathead National Forest to its responsibilities on that level of coordination as well. Oh, indeed, I'm the tribe's former Fish and Wildlife Director, so don't worry about that. <laughs> Great. Good. Thank you. Don't land over there. <laughs> yeah. and, Mr. and Mr. Chairman, in our meeting last night, uh, uh, Quinn Carver was there. He's the district ranger for the Lolo, and he said the Lolo National Forest is going to begin a forest planning process beginning very soon. So just so you're aware of that, too, because that has impact on uh, you all as well. So. He's, they're going to be putting out a news release, and he said recreation is a huge component of their forest plan. And I don't think they've updated the plan for about more than 15 years, so that's going to be have another impact as well. Yeah, you yeah, mentioned that it's going to be a quick push through, three to four years, I believe, right, Bill? Right. 
Oh, that's right. Thanks, Grace. Yeah, we have, uh, you know, we have ownership in all the Forest Service landscape, so and we have protectable interest in the increase in populations here and the increased recreational presence on the landscape is becoming uh, impactful to our subsistence uses. And so there's a direct relationship to it. And so we need to step up more and make sure the Forest Service is very well aware of what we're concerned about um, as far as impacting our, our use of our tree resources. So that means whatever it is for sustaining bull trout, cutthroat populations, maintaining elk and moose, moose habitat, uh, taking care of our, our, our grizzly bear populations, uh, whatever it might be, those are all very important along with gathering different plants and, and um, other things. So um, paramount on our concern. So those are, when we talk to the Forest Service, those are always our lead-in uh, lead statements. Great. You know, as a resident, I am in Condon. Uh, I can't imagine my backyard. I have a big meadow. In the spring, the elk come in every spring. I have 30 to 60 elk. And in the fall, they come in and you listen to them bugle all night long. You listen to the owls hoot. I just can't imagine that all going away. <laughs> yeah, one of the uh, deep concerns for this type of a uh, promotional thing is a lot of people don't understand the effects of winter recreation. They don't understand the impact there is to mm -hmm. um, lynx or other species um, trying to earn a living out there when you introduce, you know, helicopter skiing or cross country trails or snowmobiling in areas that that's not a normal thing. It's not right. either. So um, those cumulative impacts are tremendous on the resources. And that's one of the scariest things about this developer is that that's when one of the main things they want to introduced for the rich upper class Americans in in our backyard. Uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, you make a great point. Winter, you, winter recreational use, uh, the, the district ranger last night was talking about that they're seeing increased use of winter recreation. And two, on the economic side, we want to make sure that, you know, you know, Normal people, you know, with lot not a lot of economic resources, can still enjoy our public lands and not be locked out of, of this. Pro what we're seeing is a lot a differentiation between you know, people with a lot of money and then those without, and then losing access to these public lands. So that is a big concern of ours as well. So we, we don't want to take any more. We understand what you have. We had thirty minutes and. What I'll do and will do is send you the Martin, the Bowley Center uh, letter as well. And we do have we do have an online petition that we've started too, and I think we already have over four thousand signatures on it, and, and people from all over the country are signing onto that, just saying they they oppose this project. So we can send you a link to that just so you can see what we're doing as well. And if you do have any questions of us and um, please feel free to reach out to us. And we really appreciate you taking the time to listen to us. And, and we look forward to working with you in the future too. Thank you, Bill. Yep. Thank you, Mr. Thank Chairman you. and Council. Thank you, Thank Thank you Council, you. very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Good day. Yeah, you, good, good day. day. Good. Thank good you. Day. All right, next on the agenda, we have Janet. Oh, I better put my glass. <laughs> Good afternoon. Um, so today we have the results of our feasibility study for the livestock finishing yard. And we've been working with the cattle producers to help them find better prices for their livestock over the last few years. And we're exploring ways to provide meat for tribal food security and sovereignty. Um, we received a grant from rural development as well as from the Northwest Area Foundation to complete a few studies one for the meat processing plant, or two for the plant, and then one for this finishing yard. Um, Raven Consulting um, completed the work and they're here to present um, the results of their findings. So um, with that, I believe Jeff is on the call. 
Oh, and Vern. Hi, Vern. Hi. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Hello. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the Tribal Council. We'd like to take this opportunity to thank you for the opportunity to work on this project. Uh, as you're aware, this project was to look, take a look at the Bison Springs Ranch and determine whether or not it could be operated as a beef finishing plant. Um, purpose of that would be to provide slaughter weight, natural grass fed beef to your uh, meat processing plant if you develop that plant. Purchase cattle from local producers at competitive prices and provide a, another local market for some of your livestock producers. Um, we took a look in and we'll cover later the ranch and the facilities on the ranch. Um, but there were a few things uh, that we determined would need to be added to the to the property. Uh, and one of them would be a hay shed to protect the the value and condition of the hay that would need to be fed out. Um, there would need to be a couple of cattle shade sheds because um, in the area that would be pastured out, there are no natural trees or or shade protection. Uh, and then there's a hydraulic cattle chute located in the sorting pens, and it does not have a cover over it uh, to protect that piece of equipment and to provide a dry place for operating it, uh, we would recommend that that cattle chute be covered, that a lid be put over that to protect it, and also um, add a live scale, live weight scale uh, in that area and provide a lid over that too. Um, there's some additional farm equipment that would need to be purchased. Um, I won't go into those right now. They'll be covered later in section four of our report. Um, the one thing that, that popped up immediately is how much cash is required to start up the operation. As you're aware, it would you would need to be purchasing cattle uh, for several months before they are ready to go to slaughter, um, staging those over months so that in future months, you have a number of cattle to send to slaughter. Uh, so we took a look at that and broke that down. Uh, the revenues from the sale of the slaughter, once you start sending animals to slaughter, uh, can be used to cover some of those operational costs. But by the time we got finished with this feasibility, um, there basically is, is no way to operate it um, without a loss. So it it shows a continued loss. Because of that, the startup operational costs would need to be provided by the, by the tribe. Uh, it would not qualify at any of the banks as a, a standard uh, loan because the operation would, would have no way of showing that it could repay that loan or make payments on the loan. So. And that likely continues into the future of, of any operation there. There's a number of reasons um, that we believe that is the case, and we'll cover those as we go through the, the financial portion of the feasibility study. Um, the operation of the, of the beef finishing ranch would supply most of the natural grass fed beef for the processing plant and the study determined attempts to determine if the operation of such a natural grass fed finishing plant can can operate on on this property so those are the the intro parts of of the project i'll turn it over to jeff now and he can go through some of the other sections of this report that we have for you <clears throat> and i believe he's on page 72 of your packet yeah. Um, so when look, looking at the feasibility plan options, we started, <clears throat> our initial plan started out with having feeding pens um, so that when those animals are purchased at, uh, at 600 to 750 pounds, there'll be several months where they'll either be put out to pasture to add weight 
and then for the last 60 to 90 days confined in pens and still fed hay to kind of try to keep that grass fed, uh, natural grass fed designation. Um, that was the original plan. Um, and I believe we had three to four uh, feed pens in mind for the number of animals that we were looking at putting through this uh, to, uh, feedlot to supply the processing plant. Um, and then something to take in consideration is when you confine in cattle in excess of 45 days, there's federal regulations that have to be followed regarding spacing needs, lot designs, watering systems, and waste removal. Um, and then construction of those feed pens would require building shelter, water, uh, providing water supply to the pens, building feed bunks, a cement apron for the feed bunks, and then a sick barn connected to the alleyway that would access these feed pens. And then uh, the last thing, as far as option one would operate as the operation of those feed pens would also require construction of liquid waste and manure collection pond to protect any surface waters or creeks slash irrigation ditches that run through the property. Um, and that's controlled by USDA, NRCS, and it's there's an agricultural waste management field handbook that covers that in detail. So we took this initial idea and then discussed it um, with someone who's considered an expert in the field. Uh, his name is Chris Roper. And when we laid out the designs of this and the idea, there was a couple of things that he brought to our attention regarding um, one of the concepts, which is sticking with you know, providing grass fed, grass finished beef to the meat processing plant. And that is, he, he pointed out to us that in order to keep that natural um, designation of grass fed beef, these animals should never be combined, confined in feeding pens. Um, and then another thing to consider was the construction cost of feeding pens um, and, the, and the sick barn um, would have a high like initial cost um, for this uh, feeding finishing lot. Um, and then a couple of other things that he has expertise in, which is, you know, the waste management, um, how the land is laid out. And I'm just going to switch over to an overview of the property in case you're not familiar with it. So this is Highway 200 here. And the property slopes this is south down here. So it slopes from the south to the north and pretty much is a constant slope until you get to the jo lower Jocko Canal that runs through the property here. The only true real flat land is you do have a flat irrigation land right here that's close to the house on the property. But this area here is your majority of your flat land. So when looking at um, constructing feed pens, this area right here, which is next to the, uh, the corrals that are already on the property, this area right here would be the area considered for feeding pens. Um, so when he, when we discuss this with him, um, you would need to somehow capture that manure and animal waste in a pond, and you could reuse that for fertilizing and all that but it really takes away this chunk of land that was used to cut hay in this lower area. And then you've also got um, hay land right over here. Nowhere else on the property would you be able to put feed pens because of this slopage would drain down towards this canal. And there are in that waste management handbook that I referenced earlier, um, that would kind of kind of go against regulation. So that's why the feed pens were limited into this flat area here. <clears throat> so with the things that Chris Roper um, said to us, we then he then pointed us into a direction of um, finishing those cattle strictly on pasture, not building the feed pens. So you'd save that cost. And then looking at the structures that are already on the property, which I'll go over later. Um, and then, so your, your main costs of feed are gonna be um, additional grazing pastures for your cattle and then hay over the winter months. 
And what this also does is it takes the designation of what's called a confined animal operation off this property. So, because you're not confining these animals. All right. Um, so with that, we changed, like I said, we changed it to strictly pasture um, uh, grazed animals. And then that's kind of what I labeled here as option two. And so what you'll see from here on out um, kind of goes with in that direction instead of the more expensive costs and more regulated um, feed pens as we first were kind of going the direction we we're going into. All right, so then moving on to the Bison Spring Ranch. So we toured the um, Bison Spring Ranch and just kind of gave an assessment of what was there, um, whether it's equipment or buildings, how the land is laid out, and then looking at still going with this finishing lot um, kind of operation, what would be needed as far as construction or additional equipment in order to operate this as a finishing lot. So on the property, um, there's the ranch house, and that is was currently when we toured that at the end of August, um, they had been uh, renovating it to get it up to an, a habitable, an, a habitable uh, structure, because I believe it was had been sitting empty for approximately one and a half years. Um, it's a three bedroom, three bathroom property. Um, and there's also a guest um, house, which is currently housing the, what would you call it? The person in the guest house is like the property manager. Property manager. Property manager. Um, so in addition to the ranch house, there's a barn. It's a 30 by 50 structure with a hayloft up above. The barn does sit on a concrete slab. There are two separate pens inside the barn and then an office slash storage room in that barn. Um, if you looked at use, using the barn as a sick barn for that option one, which would be feed pens, it's not doable because that barn is located very closely to that Jocko, lower Jocko Canal. Um, so that's why when we first looking at option one, we look at needing to build an additional sick barn. But in option two, this can be used as a sick barn because you're not going to be having any pens coming off of that barn, which would be releasing animal waste into the Jocko Canal. Then there's a shop located on the property, um, and it consists of a tool machine room along with um, a large bay area that had four door, four large bay doors, and the shop is in pretty good condition. Um, down below, there are corrals um, and sorting pens, and all of those, the fencing and everything looked like it was in pretty good condition in that area. As Vern mentioned earlier, there's also um, a hydraulic chute um, that is operable. Um, this cattle chute, um, like I said, is near those pens. What we would look at is if you're gonna utilize this cattle chute in the area that's at, you'd also need a, need a live weight scale to monitor the weights of these animals. And then those would be pretty close to each other so that you can build a cover structure to protect both the scale and the cattle chute from the elements. Um, there were irrigation systems on the property that provided irrigation to the hay grounds. Um, some repair and renovation may be necessary, but those were looking like they were in pretty good operations. They were mostly wheel lines. Um, the farm equipment is pretty aged and operable, but would look, likely require um, increased maintenance costs due to its age. Uh, and then we have a list later of additional equipment that would be recommended for um, operation of a finishing uh, lot on this property. Water supply on the land, there's two wells. Uh, the well logs show that um, there's a six inch casing and an eight inch casing. One of the wells provides the water to the ranch house while the other provides the irrigation water for that upper hay land that I was showing earlier that's next to um, the house. And then the hay ground on the ranch is 
approximately a total of 30 acres and um, according to uh, Jackson Adams, he said they got about 50 ton off of the first cut of that in 2022. Um, we never did get a report on what the second cutting of that was able to get. Um, and all of that hay ground is irrigated. Um, and as we go through this operation idea later is that after the first cut of hay, you can use that irrigated land for irrigating grazing pasture in order to extend your grazing period later into the fall. Um, and then the estimated carrying capacity of the ranch pasture area um, was estimated at 50 cow-calf pairs. Um, as, as I show later in some of my um, financial charts, this wouldn't be adequate for the number of animals needing to be on pasture during the grazing months of May through October. Um, and we did discuss with Tribal Lands Department additional grazing pastures available in the area. Um, and we'll go through that cost a little bit later too. As I mentioned earlier, the layout of the land, that slope goes from the south to the north, from upper to the lower land. And then the very northern uh, panhandle of the property is the flat part as it approaches Highway 200. Um, the Jocko, Lower Jocko Canal runs through the property and then there is an irrigation that comes off of that property to feed a pump house, which irrigates that lower hay area. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, the slope of the property does not lend itself well to a feed pen operation as the nat natural drainage would drain towards those surface waters and creek in that upper area. Uh, fencing conditions. Uh, fencing was in good shape and there had been some repairs done in 2022, but that seems to be an annual ongoing thing since there's a resident elk herd that tends to damage um, the higher pasture boundaries of the property. And then next we'll go through the equipment needs as far as what we looked at, um, what would be needed to run this operation. Um, You've got a one and a half, one to one ton to one and a half ton four wheel drive pickup with a flat bed, flat bed to allow for transporting of and feeding of the large round hay bales. Um, this also would be used to pull the livestock trailer, which is the second item we have listed. Is a livestock trailer. Um, I believe we estimated that at 20, 24 feet livestock trailer. Um, and then as we mentioned earlier, a live weight scale would be needed so that you can monitor the weights of that uh, livestock as you're getting them up to slaughter weight. Uh, a rough terrain four, four by four forklift. This would be used to unload the hay coming in on semi trailers and then stacking those round bale hay, uh, round hay bales um, under the hay structure, which I'll mention a little bit later. Uh, and then you'll need a round bale feeder that you can install on the flatbed of the pickup for transport, transporting the bales out into the feeding pastures. Two ATV four-wheelers uh, to be used for ranch um, uh, chore operations around the property, and then also for fence repairs around the property. And then office equipment, such as your standard computer system, printer, telephone, and filing cabinets for the financial reporting and operations of the ranch. Construction needs, um, as we mentioned earlier, the cover over the weight scales and the cattle chutes, that'll help provide them uh, protection from the elements. And then two livestock shade sheds that Vern mentioned earlier in that lower hay ground area, since there is no natural shade for those animals. And then a hay storage shed, um, and that'd be necessary to protect the investment and quality of the hay purchased um, or produced for feed. And we'll get into also like dimensions. There's So there's a separate set of spreadsheets that were sent to Janet, but they're also kind of incorporated into this report. And they give a little more details on these construction scales and sizes. Um, so the cost, cost broke breakdowns, I guess, Expand that so it's easier to see. 
um, on that construction and the equipment that we had just mentioned. Um, so like I said, when we were looking at a hay shed, it's about 35 feet wide, 60 feet long and 20 feet high. And this would be more than adequate to supply the hay that would need to be purchased before winter and the amount of tonnage I'll go into later in a later chart. Uh, the roofing for the shoot and scale area, the additional animal shade sheds, and then the office or the equipment needs down here. And a lot of this equipment we priced out at used prices. Um, Most of it one to three years old. So it's not too old, but it's not new. Yeah. Um, so these construction costs and these equipment costs um, can help provide an idea of in addition to your first year cattle purchases, first year hay purchases, and first year operational expenses, um, what kind of capital outlay we'd be looking at, which I believe now Mern will go into the structure of this operation as we saw it. So um, we would recommend that, that the organizational structure be set up as its own Section 17 Corporation. Uh, tribal government would establish the Section 17 Corporation and elect probably a three-member board. Uh, the board of directors then would hire their general manager, uh, and then the general manager would be responsible for reporting back to the board, and the board would be responsible for reporting back uh, to the tribal council, tribal government. Um, the manager's main responsibilities would be to conduct all day-to-day -day operations, be responsible for uh, all of the administrative duties um, associated with, with the operation, such as the accounting and, and paying the bills and um, buying the livestock, uh, arranging for sale of the livestock when they're getting towards the end, uh, producing reports to the board of directors on a monthly basis to let uh, report on the condition of the animals, the their weight gains, um, any issues that they're having with, with the animals, sicknesses or, or issues like that. Um, and then conduct all, all of the hiring of any additional staff that uh, he would need for ranch hands or, or throughout the different seasons of the year. Uh, and then ensuring that, that all of the animals are, are kept humanely. Um, that's one of the requirements of any operation uh, such as this is there are regulations governing how the animals are are handled uh, and to ensure that they're they're handled humanely. So um, that's about on that one, I guess. Okay. <clears throat> there is a we we did include. Um, an example of um, a ranch manager position description. I looked at a few different options that I could find and research and kind of put this one together. It's included later on as one of the attachments to your study. Yeah, attachment A. <clears throat> so through research from different extension offices uh, at like South Dakota State University, Kansas State University, Idaho, University of Idaho, um, and then Montana State University. There was pretty good research on budgeting for a cattle ranch operation, um, whether it was, you know, cow-calf operation, a steer operation, or what we were looking at, which is a, a finishing lot operation. So to begin with, I wanted to look at the inventory of the cattle um, and going back to what Chris Roper uh, said that starting off with the processing plant um, is doing no more than 15 to 20 animals ready for slaughter per month at the processing plant, which for those of you that were in on that presentation back in May, the first two years we built out into that processing plant were um, operating at less than 100% as this plant developed its market 
and then got to full operation. So it's the numbers that of dialing it down from 15 to 20 doesn't really affect the revenues of the processing plant in those first two years. But also it looks at this property, Bison Spring Ranch, and what is feasible for it as far as how many animals can you be operating on that ranch property throughout the year. With that we did a survey on that meat processing plant project to survey producers and we got responses from those producers as far as when they take their animals to market at what pound are they usually are the average pound that they're taking to market so i could use that data to figure out okay if this finishing lot was to operate and look at purchasing animals that could be ready for slaughter a certain amount ready for slaughter each month um, when would those purchases need to be made? How many days would that animal need to be um, on pasture at the property or on leased land to get up to slaughter weight? And that's what this chart is doing right here. So depending on the purchase month, the purchase weight, how many pounds are needed to gain to get to 1,100 pounds, I could look at when these animals would be ready for slaughter. And this was my first breakdown so that I could start planning out kind of like a, a cost of goods sold or an inventory um, for this finishing lot. And so with, these, with this data here, then I move on to this next chart, which is kind of a flow chart looking at coloring out my months that during January through April and in November and December definitely would require hay. Um, and then looking at, okay, if we start this operation in January, purchase 30 animals in January and then 15 February, 15 March, the way this flows is it goes from left to right. And so these 30 that were purchased in January based on the average of two to mm -hmm. two and a half pounds um, of weight gain per day, 15 would be ready for August, 15 in September, and that's the way this chart flows. Now, even when you look at like March, the purchase in March, it just flows so that these, the numbers in red are the, the ideal animals that you'd be sending to the processing plant um, from the finishing lot. So that each, each month, there's a certain amount that's going to that plant. Um, this kind of gives, me an idea as you'll see through as these charts flow along of the next step in this process um, and like i said we provided all this information in the original spreadsheets to janet so anybody can take these and plug in numbers and then look at okay how's this inventory going to be flowing through the plant say if they want to increase the amount of cattle on this ranch so then this chart then gives me an idea of moving on um, kind of what I can do with the year one and year two cattle inventories, knowing that let's say you start in January and you've got your 30. So what I'm doing down here is kind of keeping a tally of um, how many animals you have on the property or on pasture down here on this on pasture line. And that gives you an idea, especially during the months of May through October, um, knowing that this Bison Spring Ranch can only provide for about 50 head, how many additional AUMs or acres you're going to need to uh, lease for grazing in other parts um, around the area. Um, and then what it also does is, you know, based on I believe 25 pounds of hay per day, an per average, of 25, an average pounds of 25 pounds. Um, I can also determine how much hay is needed each month for however many animals are on um, in the inventory of the finishing lot. And then in your first year, obviously, as Vern mentioned earlier, and I mentioned also, you know, you have purchases at the beginning of the year, but nothing's going to slaughter until the earliest would be August if you started this operation in January. And then as this flows through, 
from August, you can see each month in year one, and then this is year two down here, there's a certain amount that's going to slaughter each month of grass-fed cattle. Um, and so year two is when you really get a full year's perspective of um, your full operations of cattle, where how much hay you're going to need in a full year winter, and then also the idea of, especially during these grazing periods, May through October, how many additional um, acres you're going to need for grazing that are not available on this property. So then knowing the inventory for each animal, um, what I did then was started to create spreadsheets that are broken down. And a lot of this research, like I said, came from extension offices from different universities. South Dakota had a really good um, set of spreadsheets that I could look at and kind of budget out, okay, per, per head of cattle, um, what's the expected purchase price? What's the expected sales price? What are the associated direct costs for that animal? And I will go ahead and just zoom down. It's an attachment B that these spreadsheets start or attachment C, I believe. Okay. So let's look at yeah, what page are they on? Oh, that's um, page 92. 92 for you guys. Uh, so attachment C looks at the January purchases. Um, so the total hundred weight of the animal that you're selling, most they're all going to be at 1,100 pounds um, ready for slaughter. Um, these numbers that on the original spreadsheets, like I said, that Janet has, these numbers that you play with as far as the ones that are in yellow are the ones that you're going to be changing depending on the data that we've gone through so far um, and the prices that these animals are being purchased at. Um, so then you enter the data up here and then you enter your feed costs, which we were looking at hay, alfalfa mix, and then you've got your mineral and salt. And for the January ones, there are no pasture costs because these animals are on the pasture of the property. Um, if you just keep that 30 on um, Bison Spring Ranch property until they're ready in August and September, those 30 animals wouldn't require additional grazing lands so there's no additional cost for pasture costs for those animals. Um, and then I kind of put out a chart as far as Montana calf prices um, that were available October, 20, uh, October of this year. And then for each animal, you're looking at your gross income um, and then your operational costs, which those operational costs not only include the feed, but also veterinary and drugs, the supplies and transportation. And for transportation, we did an estimate of, it's all gonna depend on where the processing plant is, but an average of 40 miles round trip from Bison Springs Ranch. Um, so those numbers can be adjusted too, depending on where the processing plant finally decides to be put. Um, so this, all these, spreadsheets and attachment C just kind of go through each month. This would be the February purchase, what weight it was purchased at and how many there are and when they're sold. So it kind of gives you an idea of, like I said, just the all the different things that go into figuring out the cost of that animal. So that then when I go back to um, the next set of sheets in the feasibility report study, um, you can understand where I'm getting my numbers from purchase group revenues and costs of those that cattle so then going back up into where we left off up here all right so the next spreadsheet is just going to summarize those direct that income and direct costs associated with just the cattle. Um, and I got your purchase month, which is laid out here. 
sales month. And in your first year, you're only going to attain revenues from those January, February, and March purchases because your sales start August, September, October, November, and then in December. And so you can show what the year one net revenues are, but then you're also going to have year one direct costs, which is just the purchases for the rest of the year, but those sales won't be made until the following year two. Um, so year one is going to have that additional um, expenditure outlay because you, you don't recognize those revenues until the following year. Um, so you've got this revenue and then you've got this direct cost of the rest of that inventory that you're carrying through year one. Um, so this, this chart then will flow into the next part, which, okay, outside of your direct costs for those for that cattle on the property that you're operating under the finishing lot, you have other costs, which, you know, your staffing costs, as Vern mentioned earlier, um, and there's some edits that we need to make. Janet pointed out I, um, the ranch manager's salary. I should probably list that here because we just kind of grouped it together as staffing. But I do have a chart that will break it down by the ranch manager and then the 35000 that we budgeted for um, temporary hired hands throughout the year. And then you've got your other operational, indirect operational costs, which include, of course, your power and utility, irrigation charges, equipment repairs and maintenance, fuel for the farm equipment and other truck use, um, board of director fees, and any other expense category and other expense category to cover miscellaneous costs such as fence repairs um, and those power utility and irrigation costs we got that information from the cskat tribal lands department based on the 2022 amounts that were spent when you get into estimating fuel equipment repairs and maintenance costs for the equipment that you operate on the property um, there was a study from the Iowa State University Extension Office that had an, an, an extensive study on based on the type of farm equipment, based on the estimated hours that it's been used. This is what your percentage um, of repairs are going to be annual on an annual basis. And then also, this is the estimated um, mileage, gas mileage fuel, rate, fuel, fuel rate, fuel consumption rate for. Um, equipment and that's where these numbers come into play so our first numbers we were looking at estimating was your repairs and maintenance and obviously the older the equipment is the uh, higher the repair maintenance expenses are going to be estimated at um, so the the current property uh, the current equipment on the property is a two-wheel drive john deere 4640 tractor then there was a mower and conditioner, a large round baler, a fertilize, fertilizer spreader, a rake, and a John Deere skid steer. Um, and estimating those values at what they would be at now and the estimated hours used, we could come to the repairs and maintenance per year. And then looking at that same equipment, um, what is the fuel consumption on those items? And then adjusting uh, down here for the older tractor, for that John Deere tractor, because um, I believe it's 1980. It looked like a 80 model. 1980 model. Um, and then adding a, an additional 50 gallons per year for other non-haying use, such as for the skid steer. Um, we can estimate our total fuel consumption uh, costs and then that same study um, estimates, based on your fuel consumption costs, 15% of that is an average for your lubrication maintenance costs. Um, so we continue to flow through and then utilize this data from here also to determine what our net income uh, or slash loss is before the interest depreciation and amortization for the first three years of the operation. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, in year one, you have those five months of revenues, net revenues, and then you have the additional cattle purchases where the revenues won't be recognized until year two. 
So your net after your cost of goods sold in year one is obviously already at operating at a loss with those uh, cattle purchases made um, where no revenues are recognized until year two. Um, the other thing uh, that I did not mention is with the irrigated hay land on the property, um, we recommend that the first cut be put out for sale because when you are looking at um, using hay for the winter months, especially when you're trying to uh, look for quality premium hay, the hay from that first cut on the property would lose a bit of its nutrient value before the winter months come. So when you're looking at purchasing hay for those uh, November through spring months, you'd be better off purchase, purchasing it somewhere else. Um, and primarily purchasing um, second and third cuttings where you, the value and nutritional value for your weight gain uh, would be better. And then also, um, so utilizing that first cut as a source of revenue for this operation, but also that irrigated past um, land could be used as irrigated pasture land for those later months of like September and October. Um, so then plugging in the other costs, um, you have the total from your other costs uh, is $159,000 and some change. So your total net income slash loss for the first year, you're looking at $322,000 for the size of operation. Um, on this ranch. Um, and then year two and year three, that is smaller because you have a full year of operation for revenues. Those revenues are pretty slim when you're looking at a finishing lot and you're purchasing the animals. Um, so it's not the best outcome, but then we continue on to give the full financial idea of this is then we got to determine the interest on a loan depreciation and amortization. So then going back to the total costs of the initial capital outlay, like I said, uh, I just looked at total purchase costs of all the cattle, um, your ranch manager, which here's the number the, based on the Department of Labor, Department of Labor Statistics, um, what the ranch manager should be making, fringe benefit and the annual payroll, and then his hired hand budget your operational costs for the first year, the cost of purchasing equipment and then construction for additional structures on this property. So your total year one capital outlay would be looking at somewhere around 631,000 um, for you needed to be loaned. Um, and, and actually the, the operation does not provide any ability to repay a loan. So that's where I had indicated earlier, it's not going to be a conventional loan through a bank. Uh, it not would probably not even be a good idea for the tribe to set it up and structure it as a loan because going forward, there is no profitable situation here. So this operation is not going to demonstrate that it has the ability to repay any kind of a loan. If you were to do this um, and go forward with it, the tribe would need to provide the upfront money as contributed capital into the corporation and likely contribute money annually for the losses because there would be no way for the, <clears throat> for the operation to continue to make any kind of loan payments. So we put the cost of financing in here um because that's typically a a point in a feasibility study uh it's a it's a typical operational cost the cost of interest or the cost of money so that's built in here just to to provide an estimate for what it would cost if this were in a profitable situation and you had to borrow the startup money and borrow the oper annual operation money so then the next chart is just kind of an amortization table of a five-year loan for the amount that would be needed for this. Um, and then, then we calculate depreciation based on the equipment uh, that was purchased for this uh, ranch operation. And then we come to our final net profit slash loss after, after interest depreciation amortization 
and we show those as indicate that those losses are a lot larger. We played around with the numbers uh, quite a bit to determine, uh, see if it made any difference and see if we could make this operation at least break even or come close to break even. Um, there are there are several things that play into this. One is the size of the size of the ranch itself is only about fifty percent um, of the size of acreage that you need to operate. Um, Two hundred and forty head of of finished beef going into the processing plant throughout the year, year after year. Uh, you're only talking about two hundred and forty animals, so even bumping that up to a larger number uh, didn't provide uh, a break-even point. Um, the additional costs, when you look back at some of the reports Jeff went over with you and look at the cost per animal, uh, you, you basically have two major things going against you here uh, outside of the, the ranch site itself. One of them is that you're purchasing all the animals and that that margin between what you're purchasing the animal for from the provider uh, producer and what you can sell it to the, to your plant for that margin is is too close. So it doesn't provide a big enough margin to cover all of your feed costs and operational costs and spread your management costs out in between those animals that are produced. So bumping the numbers up increases your your feed costs increases your land lease costs um, and several other cost management costs uh, so the revenue that you can generate by larger numbers is more than eaten up by the additional costs of of feeding basically if, if the operation if the ranch were twice its size and had about 100 acres of irrigated Haylands, uh, it would be easier to to get this close to a break even point, but that's what it would take. Um, you would need to to have the operation so that you're not buying hay. Uh, that's a that's a huge cost at two hundred and fifty dollars a ton. Um, some of the hay is that you would be buying might even be higher than that. Um, prices that we looked at ranged anywhere from $225 a ton to $300 a ton, depending on where you bought it. And then the cost of getting it here uh, would be in addition to that. So um, that that cost is, is a big cost. And the fact that you don't have enough acreage to produce all the hay that you need uh, is, is a factor that just plays into the more animals you have, the more hay you're gonna have to buy, um, the bigger the, the deficit at the end of the year. So we come to the financial summary. Um, and basically, that's it. The, the cost of, of producing each animal to a finishing state ready to go to slaughter um, is just too high. Um, and without the additional acreage, uh, even leasing the additional acreage, um, the cost of that and the cost of purchasing your feed uh, is going to keep this project in a loss situation year after year after year. So, you know, that didn't appear that we could get it to a break even point. Um, and that's where we ended the, the project with the recommendation that you probably would would not want to use this particular property um, doesn't doesn't fare well for for the operation um, it, and the slope of the property also gives you some additional problems because you do have to protect those surface waters and, and the canal. So anyone have any, any questions questions? Well, thank you, Vern. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, questions from council? Uh, go ahead, Terry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just some comments. I appreciated 
the work that went into this. I thought they're quite accurate in their information. But I was had wrote down here, and I'm glad that Vern mentioned that at the end there. I just don't this size of operation there because feeding out you probably need room to raise corn too to finish those cattle. So hay and corn would be quite a cost. But um, and I would also encourage from that from Dixon on down to Perma up to Hot Springs to Nyrat, the weather is usually a little more forgiving than when you get up closer to the missions. I was thinking it'd be nice to be able to have like five acre pastures and put your feeders in there and then just drag your um, your tub or whatever you're gonna feed in around so they wouldn't have to be congregated into, uh, you get too many cattle into one spot then you definitely have a, a feedlot problem. But I would like, definitely am in support of a processing plant I think that's well needed, and I'm sure there's other tribes that would be interested in in supporting that. Uh, the feedlot, the finishing feedlot, that would probably be nice to see if we had some other parcels around that would would fit in. I do pretty familiar with that property. My when I was a kid, my grandparents used to own that. Of course, their house was down by the Krells. It was just a little shack, and anyway, they since moved and sold that and it's I've watched it progress but I think they have problems with their irrigation pumps there and I know that house has been added on to and I know that there's problems with it freezing up in the pipes underneath so it just seems like in the past it was almost better to instead of renovating something it's almost better to start up and build something correctly from the beginning but appreciated the work it went into this and I thought they did a nice job and I thought the summary was where I was feeling it should go. Thank you, Terry. Any other comments? I know you have a lot of numbers in here that I didn't know of, so um, there's great great information in here, Vern and Jeff, and I appreciate your work and diligence with this report, feasibility. Mr. Carol? Chairman? Oh, yeah, Carol, then go um, oh. oh, I'm sorry. I didn't see. Go ahead. Good, Carol. Okay. Yeah, Fern, I was just wondering, would this be considered an organic cattle farm then or not? Uh, it wouldn't qualify as organic. Um, there's another set of definitions and regulations you need to follow for that. But what we were looking at was not uh, grain or corn fed, but finished all on natural grass fed beef. Uh, natural grass fed beef if you can obtain it and process it through your processing plant, it sells for about $2 a pound higher than uh, grain or corn fed finished animals. Um, and that's a trend that's going across the country and everything that we see in, in our research indicates that at least in the next 10 years, that's gonna continue to increase year after year after year. So that was one of the main reasons that the that the tribe had indicated that they wanted a natural grass fed finished animal to see if they can capture that market through your processing plant. Um, that's still the ideal thing that may not be uh, obtainable for all of your processed beef through your through your plant. Um, the next option, I guess, um, which really isn't a part of what we were hired to do here, but I spent some time looking in the state of Montana at um, other feedlots, finishing yards that are, are operation uh, to determine whether there's a, the ability to um, move uh, animals from those into your feed plant to buy them directly off of these other feedlots. Um, one of the closest and largest is probably the one at Shoto, Montana. Uh, I think it's called Northern Montana Feeders. Uh, it's a fairly large feedlot, um, but again, it doesn't it doesn't designate natural grass fed uh, operation. It feeds uh, grains and corns and and other products to those animals to finish them off. The Oxbow Ranch down uh, just south of Lolo on the Bitterroot. 
uh, is a ranch that is is a fairly large operation that produces a lot of natural grass-fed beef, but they produce boxed beef and sell their animals to individual customers. They do a lot of of sales to a lot of restaurants uh, in the in and around Hamilton, uh, Missoula, and even up in in the valley. Here, are some you'll see their their product. Uh, like most natural grass-fed operations, they don't sell their beef to processing plants. They have their own processing plant and they raise their calves um, to go to slaughter for, for their product. So they can guarantee that they know that that animal has been on grass and no other types of feed all the way through slaughter. Um, it would be nice if, if you could work out some kind of agreement to purchase some of their slaughter ready animals uh i don't know if they would do that uh, i didn't try to contact them to to ask that question but most of your natural grass-fed operations operate like that um which is part of the reason i think that that they can do it at, at so much better profit they're getting a lot more for the product that they sell in boxed beef when they sell it they have a lot of value-added products that they're marketing across the country uh, jerky and summer sausage and smoked beef and packaged boxed specialty meats and so forth that they sell. Uh, you can go on their webpage and, and look at their pricing and look at what they package together in boxed beef in, in packages for sale to customers. And they'll sell a half a beef, a quarter of beef, a whole beef, or just boxed beef specialty packages. So uh, they're pretty good at, at marketing that. And that's probably what you would need to do to try to make an operation of grass-fed um, beef work. The, the difficulty here is the third leg of, of this project was to try to find a way to operate a, a natural grass-fed finishing yard that can also purchase the animals from your local producers and try to purchase that at uh, a premium so that they get a, a better price for their their animals that they take to market. The other option you you might have um, is to sit down and, and work with the local producers. You, and again, you're only talking about 250 animals per year, so it's not a large number. It's not going to make a, all your producers happy. Um, in our survey, in the first feasibility study we did, uh, there were a good number of, of producers that indicated they could hold their animals over to, and sell them the following year at higher higher sale weights. So uh, you might talk to some of them and, and do contracts with them, them to have them produce the 1,100 pound animals finished on pasture and, and hay um, and still be able to obtain that, that natural grass fed. Um, definition for for your USDA stamp. So, all right. Well, I was glad you got away from the feedlot. I I didn't really like that concept. And then when you talked to Mr. Roper, he seemed to have some good ideas. So, yeah, I appreciate the report, and I'm glad Harry jumped in there. I was waiting for him to respond, so I'm glad he did. Go ahead, Velda. Go ahead, Velda. I have, I'm sorry, I have a, a delay with a wonky mouse, but Vern, you answered my question. I wanted to know if you were aware of any of the um, different finishing yards that we'd be able to work with, and then perhaps we need to just follow up with this Oxbow. Um, and I also wanted to know if we'd be able to, just what she said, hold them over, if some of our producers would be able to hold them over to get them up to the 1100 Hey, um, so it sounds like that would be possible, but still it's probably a little risky, but we still have a positive feasibility analysis on the processing plant, right? We would just have to get the volume of the cattle there. 
I don't I don't know if if increasing the volume for the finishing lot would would help. Um, no, I mean the processing. The plan. processing, correct, First correct. Stop. I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, I did, Belda. I did um, some research on uh, additional feedlots in registered feedlots in Montana. There are a number of what is considered registered feedlots in the state of Montana. There actually are several uh, in our area between Kalispell and Missoula and, and on, on the Flathead Reservation. Most of them are pretty small. The annual income is is between 100,000 and 500,000 a year. They have one or two uh, staff. They're primarily look to me like they were uh, owner operated. So they didn't hire any additional people. They probably have a ranch and feed out, finish out a number of their animals and, and go from there. So um, you can go on the, on the, website for for feedlots in Montana and it'll give a listing out of of all of those there were probably 35 to 40 that I went through just to to see what sizes they were um and and some of the information is is there most all of them have a contact an address and a contact number telephone number to contact uh, so they could be contacted if if need be uh I didn't spend a lot of time and and couldn't do any billing for that because that's really not a part of this feasibility report that we we were doing. So it, it was just part of what I looked into to see if there was any other options. But that is is something you could dig into if you wanted. Thank you, Jeff Herbert. Yeah, I have a yeah. couple. Thank you. So. I guess what I'm thinking about um, was w whether or not the Bison Spring Ranch would work for the processing plant because we were trying to find a location mm -hmm. far away from residential areas, but on a highway with good access for transport for transporting the product and and bringing in the animals, and then also um, whether or not um, it had enough water. And I was looking at the well log yields and it seemed like those well yields were pretty good, but I know you you're, you wouldn't be able to build above the canal based on constraints with the land because of, unless you could pipe, somehow pipe the waste from the processing plant underneath, but then you'd lose some hay ground. Did you look at that at all um, in your analysis, whether the processing plant could be located there? We we didn't really delve into that um, much after we talked to Chris Roper. Um, the only place that you could, the only location on that ranch that you could place the processing plant would be between the existing sorting corrals and the highway. And one of the problems with that is trying to get rid of your waste. Um, you, you produce a lot of water uh, and you're gonna need a lot of water for cleaning and, and so forth. Uh, you're gonna get a lot of waste. That level property down there on the bottom doesn't lend itself very well um to settling ponds um it is an it is a ground soil type that probably doesn't prevent leaching of those contaminations into the into the soil your your two wells that operate are are also down on that property that portion of the property, they're not up higher. So uh, they're on the same level that you would produce that. Uh, I don't know that you could do that and uh, place that plant. And, and I don't know the quality of the water. So there are several things that you'd have to look into to, to make that determination that we haven't looked into on that property.
Okay, thank you. And will you be available after this meeting with council? I have a few more questions I, I needed to go over with you. Certainly. Okay, thank Certainly. You. Any other questions? Okay. Right. So do we have approval to share this um, report if um, like other um, tribes that worked with us um, on our Northwest Area Foundation project, uh, would it be okay if we shared this with those tribes? Council consensus? Fine with me. Okay. Representative. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for the feasibility study. Fern, Jeff, good job. Thank you, Council. Uh, we wish it would have come out much better. We we are anxious to see that processing plant up in operation. So, uh, thank you again for the opportunity to provide your service to you. Thank you. Thank you, Janet. Okay, we'll move to our next item on the agenda for voices of awareness good afternoon welcome you'll have to push the mic button yet you can if you push the mic button though all right hi Thank you very much for having me here today. I'm Andrea Thomas with Voices for Awareness out of Grand Junction, Colorado. Uh, the work that I do around the nation is to bring awareness to the dangers of illicit fentanyl. And I, I ask to be here today because what I'm seeing in your community is different than what I've seen all over the United States. How I became familiar with your community and with your reservation was uh, in early spring of this year. I received a phone call from a recovery clinic in the area. And staff at the recovery clinic told me that they had a client that would like to speak with me. And I was surprised because I don't usually get phone calls like that. And uh, said, sure, I would love to speak with her. And this young, lovely young lady named Sierra uh, was on the other line of, of the telephone. She had just been in recovery about two weeks. Um, she'd heard about a fentanyl poisoning in the area and thought it was very important for her to share her story and uh, potentially save someone else uh, through her experience. And she's here today. I'm very surprised by that, and I'm very happy. So I spoke with Sierra and we started doing some uh, video uh, interviews with Sierra to learn that she had overdosed several times. Sierra uh, made it through her recovery process and at her graduation was able to show the video that she made with, faces, with Voices for Awareness. She worked with our foundation a little bit longer and then brought all of her friends together from her recovery, her sober living. Um, together for an event that our organization does on the August, on August 21st. This is the first year that we did it. It's Fentanyl, National Fentanyl Prevention and Awareness Day, which will be every August 21st from here on out. Sierra put her resources together and, uh, she had a walk here in the area. They're still working hard in the recovery process. And, uh, then a few months later, we were contacted by your attorney general uh, for the state of Montana. I will tell you that I work with law enforcement, DEA, uh, legislature, and other attorney generals around the United States. I have never seen outreach like I have from the attorney general for the state of Montana. We beg people to come into their states. We beg schools to come into their states. We are very interested in saving lives. Fentanyl has killed so many people just in this last year, 107,000 people out of those 107,000 people, we believe that 77% of them, uh, as high as 90%, died from fentanyl poisoning. So imagine how delighted we are to get a phone call from your attorney general for your state 
saying, we are not asking, we are not calling you with a call to action. We are not calling you for a specific request, but we need help here. What should we do? I see hundreds of faces come across my desk every day of people that have been poisoned by fentanyl. And on that day, my yes, sir, and no, sir, I had no patience for. So when your attorney general's office asked me what they should do, I told them they needed boots on the ground. Uh, other attorney general offices around the states have very pretty websites. They do outreach through these websites. Youth does not go to a pretty website before they decide to experiment or try a drug for the first time. We just had a long period of isolation with COVID. We lost so many people during that time. We need in-person prevention for youth. Your Attorney General's office has reached out to Voices for Awareness and Facing Sentinel, which is the home of the National Day, and uh, asked about some work that we've been doing. Affected families all over the United States that I work with in my foundation have put an opioid kit together, an opioid reversal kit. And it's different than others because it has school education in it. Our schools don't know what to do. They bring health departments in. Um, and they don't have the resources often or the knowledge to address our kids with uh, fentanyl prevention. And so we've made a kit to make it easier for them. And with simple QR codes, they can give presentations to their classes. I do this all over the United States with my team, but we can't be everywhere. And this gives a school the first, uh, the basis, primary education that they can open the conversation with their students um, in school. And there's just a simple QR code on the side of this box. And we are affected families all over the United States are going to continue to add uh, secondary and tertiary information to these kits. Um, so schools have the information. This is a, we are looking at such a severe uh, crisis with our youth. God forbid, you know, I'm so, I'm so frightened to learn the numbers for this year uh, of how many that we will have lost. These aren't just numbers, they're mothers, they're fathers, they're sisters and brothers. And we have a uh, lack of concern for all of the life that we're using, losing across the United States. What I see here in your community is so different than what I've seen everywhere else, I've already said. We called your tribal council uh, Thursday of last week and made a request to speak with you. I never thought that we would be able to get in here so fast. You accepted our request to come in, and in your audience today, you, you have your Attorney General for the state of Montana, your Drug Task Force, these men and women that are in recovery. We're asking to come back uh, to your reservation and maybe with your reach to the other reservation and continue boots on the ground work to work with you to get these kids into your schools and anywhere else that people gather uh, to have naloxone for safety. Um, and we very much appreciate um, your team. They've, they've accompanied us today to the high school in Ronan. We're going to Two Eagles after this. Um, and they've set up a community event for this evening. We don't see this in any other places. We know that the state of Montana can be a leader in fentanyl prevention. You have concern for the people that live in your area. You have people that are in recovery, that know the risk, that want to reach out, that you can use uh, as peers in your schools and other areas. And you have an attorney general here that uh, is concerned about the people of the state. And if uh, I may invite him up here so he can give you some current numbers um, that reflect what's happening in your state. Thank you, Ms. Thomas. Attorney General, I, good to see you. I hate to uh, stop you, Attorney General, but this young lady <laughs> would like to say something very strange. <laughs> All right, my name is Sierra Kuhn, and I 
am the one that reached out to Voice of Awareness while I was in treatment. And <clears throat> just yesterday I was at a meeting um, and a group down at the recovery hall in Ronan and a young lady was talking about how there is not just fentanyl coming around, but there is something bigger and much stronger than that, that Narcan is not um, working for it. Um, it's taking more than just a single dose of Narcan to bring people back. It's taking more than three doses of Narcan to bring back. Um, this, it breaks my heart because um, my mother had just told me that three friends back home died of fentanyl within two weeks, and I'm from Mile City, Montana. So um, in just this past year, I've heard about many overdoses here and a lot of deaths, so I can't imagine what this new substance coming over is going to do, but I think we should be very well aware of it. Um, when, you know, I hear about when I hear more about it, I can use my resources and hand them out to people because I'm not sure exactly what it is yet or how much is over here, but I do still have outside resources that, you know, are bringing this information to me because they know that I have connections to Andrea and people in the community that know more people than I do. And um, I'm very thankful to be here and to be alive and to be a part of this community. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, members of the council, excuse me, that's my legislator coming out of me. Um, I'm Austin Knudsen, I'm the state attorney general. I hope this is all right from this position, but I, I, we've, got a, we've got a full table here. Um, Chairwoman, or councilwoman, nice to see you again. Um, Fentanyl, uh, it's, I don't think it's, it's exaggerating to say fentanyl has become the most important, and I think the most dangerous public safety issue we've got in the state of Montana. Uh, and in fact, I think it's probably the biggest threat to our country. Uh, I talked to a lot of my counterparts in other states. They're all dealing with the same thing that we're dealing with here in Montana. I, I've got a little bit of a unique perspective on fentanyl in that I, just three, four short years ago, was a county attorney in a largely reservation county. I'm from I'm from Fort Peck country. Uh, I was the county attorney in Roosevelt County working on the Fort Peck reservation every day, uh, primarily in Wolf Point and Poplar. I can tell you folks that just three short years ago, I can remember the first fentanyl case that I personally dealt with on Fort Peck. Uh, we had a known gang member from Detroit that we caught on Fort Peck. Uh, and we we had at that time what we thought was a major fentanyl bust. That individual had just just under 70 fentanyl tablets. That was considered a big bust. Those days are long behind us. Uh, we are now routinely seeing larger and larger and larger shipments and more often. Uh, I wish that was not the case, but it is. We We are now routinely, through our task force efforts, through our interdiction efforts on the highway patrol, I'm, I'm sure your your task force is going to tell you the same thing. We now see tablet shipments in the in the thousands and sometimes even close to 10,000 per shipment. Uh, this stuff is getting cheaper to make. It's getting more and more prevalent, and there's a large markup. Uh, that's why the Mexican cartels are up here selling this stuff. But what I did want to do is just give you some numbers that that we've gotten just recently. Just this morning, I received new updated information from our Rocky Mountain Haida task forces and from our state crime lab, because uh, I knew I was coming up here and I, I wanted some fresh data for you. Um, I mean, overall, just since 2017, our known fentanyl deaths in Montana have gone up. Again, this is just since, 20, since 2017. Fentanyl deaths in Montana have gone up 1,100%. 1,100%. Our state DCI, our, our Division of Criminal Investigation, Criminal investigations into fentanyl crime has gone up since 2017, 1,600%. Uh, those are two pretty staggering numbers. I can tell you that the seizures number really, I think, speaks the, the, the highest to me. Uh, just this year so far, through September 30th of this year, our task forces have seized 
roughly almost 155,000 dosage units of fentanyl. That's just this year so far. I compare that to last year. Last year, our task force has seized 37,000 dosages. So we've almost tripled and the year's not over yet. Um, number one cause of adult death, young adult death, uh, ages 18 to 45 in the US last year. Adults ages 18 to 45, number one cause of death last year was not COVID, was not car accidents, it was not heart disease, it was not cancer, it was not gun violence. It was fentanyl overdose. Uh, you heard those numbers a little, little earlier. Um, they, the, they are technically categorized as opioid overdoses, uh, but in, in, the, in law enforcement circles, we know what that means. That's fentanyl. We are just seeing this stuff everywhere, and we're seeing it laced in with more and more other illicit drugs. That's becoming more and more common at our state crime lab. We are finding heroin. We are finding marijuana. We are finding methamphetamine now, uh, all laced with fentanyl. Uh, very, very concerning, but that's because that's, that's causing our overdoses to go up. People who think they're taking drug A are now also taking fentanyl and oftentimes uh, with, with lethal results. Um, so this is a very, very dangerous time in Montana. I, I spent a lot of time traveling, talking to, talking to kids, talking to schools. I'm delighted to hear that, that Andrew's group here is, is talking to the students. Um, and we're, we're trying to be proactive about this in Montana, but candidly, it's very, very difficult. Uh, we've, we're, we're a large geographic state with a lot of highways. We've got a limited number of police forces, as I'm, as I'm sure you all know. Um, we, we're we're doing, doing the best we can, um, but the fact is we know where the stuff is coming from. It's coming from the Mexican drug cartels. They're bringing it to Montana specifically because they can make a lot of money up here. These fentanyl tablets in towns like Phoenix, in towns even like Denver and Salt Lake, these tablets are might be worth a dollar or two. But when they get them up here in certain of our communities in Montana, they can charge upwards of 80, 90, 100 dollars per tablet. That is tremendous profit motive for these Mexican drug cartels to be in Montana and to be selling this poison to our people. Um, so that's why you've seen me take such a strong position on the southern border. That's why you've taken me seeing such a strong position on these law enforcement uh, initiatives that we've got going out of the Department of Justice. So one of the great things we've got going is we're, we're doing some outreach. We're talking to nonprofit organizations like this. We're trying to get some actual resources out on the ground, out to our schools, out to our communities, because we know this stuff is everywhere. It is not just a Billings problem. It is not just a Missoula problem. It is statewide. We are seeing fentanyl in every county, in every corner, in every community in the state. Um, so we're looking for partners, just like Voices of Awareness. They're doing a fantastic job. Um, we, we've got a prospective source of funding coming our way very very soon from, from some larger opioid settlement um, litigation coming through the state. And this is one of the ways I think we can spend some of that money and, and get some resources out into the trenches, in, into the communities in Montana, and hopefully do some good. So um, I won't belabor this. You've got plenty of people here behind me to talk. I'm happy to answer any questions, but thank you all for having me. Thank you, Attorney General Knudsen. Um, education is key, very key, but also catching those uh, drug runners and locking them up and don't let them out of jail is also key. So we've, we've heard that numerous times as one of our weak points here in Montana, especially here on, on our area, is uh, it's a catch and release program where we can't tolerate that. So any help you can do as the Attorney General will be, be very greatly appreciated. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Go ahead, Carol. Yeah, one resource that I that I am knowledgeable, I'm Carol Langford, and um, one resource that I'm very um, familiar with is Lake County Drug Court, and I'm associated associated with that. And this guy right here in the green and his group, they have captured so many people and brought them into their midst and helped them down this path. You you've got a group of people. In, in that little community who have just just uh, put their arms out and now we're talking 300, 400 people that join in and want to be a part of this sobriety life. And so I think that's the place to start is your grassroots people who are out there, who have been out there using at one point and now are clean and sober. 
and making their journey and helping others. And I've seen it with my own eyes. So I think there's one avenue you can put some money in and you'll, you'll get every, every cent of it, you know, paid back in uh, people getting sober. And thank you, Magnus. I appreciate you and whoever else is from the drug courts there. Thank you, uh, Councilwoman Langford. Yeah, that, the drug courts absolutely have a very vital role to play. That's another area that we're looking at possibly putting in some of this funding. We're, we're not receiving a, a large pile of money from, from this opioid settlement, and, and we have to go through a few steps in order to spend it on some of these things. Uh, but drug courts, expanding drug courts is absolutely one of the areas that, that we're exploring. Uh, we've got a couple of judges around the state who have expressed interest in getting a drug court in, in some places that haven't had it. Um, I, I'm a big advocate. I, I think it's a great way, and, and it's definitely... One other point, Mr. Chair, we're starting a, a tribal healing court here at the tribe. So ours will be up and going probably, I think, in a month or two, or maybe this month, December. It'd be a good model for us. Yeah, go ahead. You have to push the red button. Yeah, we just finished up, or I did just finished up the white bison uh, treatment, facilitator training too. And I'm well, um, finishing up my peer sport training, and that's key to getting people out of that lifestyle that are that are using and, and, and bringing the drugs up here and selling the drugs, getting them into the recovery is huge. Uh, I'm letting you know that that's changed my life tremendously. I'm in college and I'm doing so much. And I spent 19 years in the Department of Corrections and got, getting into recovery is what's changed my life tremendously. And now I'm out helping others. And uh, that is, another avenue that that really needs funding because um, it like she said it it she's seen with her own eyes and uh, we're living proof that, that it works if i may say something uh i i work again with thousands of affected families all over the united states we work on accountability we work with legislation we work with law enforcement trying to uh uh, work on laws that uh, will hold people accountable, right, for these actions, for taking human life. Recently, we began working with uh, people in recovery and people in the addicted community. And I will tell you that that is the best um, choice that we ever made. The people that are in recovery are helping others across the United States. They've been there. They've had the experience. Uh, we have two, I have two with me today that are in recovery and speaking at your schools in the area. They're very effective. They talk the same talk. They are, <laughs> and they, uh, they present the same way that we do. And the state of Montana, in speaking with your attorney general's office, uh, you have something that hasn't really occurred here yet that's happening all over the United States. What we're seeing in other states is a lot of what is called harm reduction. Harm reduction should start with prevention. It is key. And education. In other places, we are giving harm reduction that is allowing people to continue to use and excuses. And so your state is off to a good start. You have a place right now. Um, in my opinion, that you can go the strong way uh, with the people that have already experienced substance use and uh, can help others, and they're willing to. You have a free resource right in front of your faces. And so we would like to come back into your state again, if you'll have us, and work with your people in recovery and uh, to spread prevention um, in other areas of Montana. Well, thank you, Andrea. And we'd like to invite everyone to our uh, presentation this evening. We were going to show it today. We did not know that you're in Trier's Drug Task Force and all of these lovely people who are going to be here today. So I would rather <laughs> have spent time speaking with them than showing you our video, but we will be doing that tonight at five o'clock. We appreciate your time. Where will you be doing that at? At the here at this location no. at the college okay thank you go thank ahead you. carol
Uh, sorry to uh, take the mic again, but I want to acknowledge tribal law and order and the work that you guys do. I mean, I should have mentioned you first because I know every day you're out there in the trenches and I hear about some of the busts that you guys make. And it's just totally amazing that we have done what we ha have, but there's so much more to do. But putting your lives out there on the line, law enforcement is just it's unbelievable. So I don't, the drug, is a drug task force? It's not the Northwest Drug Task Force, but it's Tribal Law and Order Task Force. Maybe Craig could come up and maybe just mention that if that's okay, Mr. Chair. Sure, you bet. I, I want to make sure they get the, We've the been trying to, and the respect that they Craig's deserve. been keeping us on top of this for quite yeah. some time. And, you know, the tragedy of this is that um, we've all been touched by this and dramatically and know somebody that's that's uh, gone now because of this. And we just don't want to be open for business for this. And that's uh, one thing Craig reminds us all the time. Go ahead, Craig. Just kind of give you an idea, as the Attorney General Knudsen said, 37,000 pills last year, not this year, but the year before. And my guys here, and I'm going to introduce you in a second, took down 35,000 so far this year. That's a lot of doses of fentanyl. And we're also over 12 pounds of methamphetamine plus cocaine, heroin, and other prescription drugs as well. Our cases typically will go federal. So you don't see them in the newspaper here. If we put them in the newspaper, the feds won't prosecute. So they do a great job. And I want to give them a shout out. So if I could have each one of them stand up. Will Methis, he's our supervisor for the task force. He's also the MMIP supervisor for our tribe. And then we have Vern Fisher. He'll be the second in command. Christian Haynes. Desmond Joseph. And, and Louis not part of the task force. He's involved in a lot of the operations of the tribe. So I don't know if I can get him to stand up if he stood up already, but Louis Fiddler as well. They they do a great job. Um, they they make us proud constantly. They're right out and like you said in the trenches doing it. And we're, you know like we're like we said a ten thousand pill seizure is something that we see. You know when when you take someone off the street who's coming in from out of state with ten thousand fentanyl doses, with the amount we've taken up just here in our reservation, how many lives have been saved because of that? And so that's kind of how we look at it. Every time we're taking those off the street, we're saving somebody's lives. And we're missing a lot of stuff, too. So give us calls, give us tips, whatever you can do to help us. And we'll work with the drug courts, we'll work with the healing courts, whatever we can do to get people fixed. So thank you. Thank you, Craig. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Sure, that's fine. We'll look forward to it this evening. We'll take a five minute break. I just want to let everybody know that we'll be back here at six o'clock tonight for a presentation here in the chambers. Thank you. Yeah. So, uh, the um, video that she's going to share is called Dead on Arrival, and it's pulled up right there, so um, I can do the share screen. And then, um, did you send the PowerPoint? She shared a, a PowerPoint that she's going to share in both presentations tonight as well. Okay. So the Johnny R. Lee and Victor Charlotte Theater at five o'clock. And then I guess there's another presentation here at six o'clock in chambers. Yeah. Yeah. 
ったら、そうです。じゃあ、
Okay, we'll come back into session. We'll have to clear the room for executive session. All right, we got the brain trust in here now. <laughs> <laughs> 